very good morning, everybody, and thank you for joining our high-level panel addressing non-communicable diseases during the COVID-19 pandemic, which has been organized by the Defeat NCD Partnership at the United Nations Institute for Training and Research with the invaluable support of Boehringer Ingelheim. Now, it's been more than 18 months since a virus that few of us had heard of forced the world into a lockdown. COVID-19 has killed almost 5 million people, while the number of confirmed cases in 221 countries and territories stands at above 242,190,723. Yes, the numbers are grim, but the data hides another less visible tragedy. Every year, non-communicable diseases or NCDs such as stroke, diabetes and cancer cause more premature deaths and suffering than COVID-19. At least 70% of deaths worldwide can be attributed to NCDs, while 86% of premature NCD-related deaths occur in low- and middle-income countries. Worryingly, the time, energy and money invested in the fight against COVID-19 has come at the expense of NCD services, which in many instances have been severely disrupted. The fight back against NCDs has seen national governments working in tandem with the World Health Organization, the United Nations and multilateral development banks, and that relationship has grown in importance. We must never forget that many of those killed by the virus were already vulnerable to infection because they had underlying conditions, in other words, an NCD. Breaking the link between COVID-19 and non-communicable diseases will not be easy, but it is a challenge worth pursuing. Having the right strategies in place to reduce NCDs increases the life chances and economic opportunities of disadvantaged communities. It also places countries on track to achieve the 2030 UN Sustainable Development Goal of reducing by a third the premature mortality rates caused by NCDs. I'd like you to hold those thoughts because we're going to open the session with the first of our speakers, Henrik Finern. Now, Henrik is the global head of More Health Sustainable Development, Boehringer Ingelheim, and he's going to explore the impact of the pandemic on NCD prevention and care, along with the role of the private sector in addressing the many gaps and challenges. So, Henrik Finern, it's very good to see you. The floor is now yours, and I stress that you have 10 minutes, 10 minutes. Thank you, Juliet. Dear summit participants, thank you for joining this panel discussion in person in Berlin as well as virtually. Thank you also to each of the panelists for taking the time to join. Bering Ingelheim is delighted to co-host the session together with the Defeat NCD Partnership. Non-communicable diseases, NCDs, are very important to us at Bering Ingelheim. They're part of the More Health Pillar, one of three pillars of our Sustainable Development for Generations framework which we'll be sharing later today. The framework reflects our principles of planning and generations, driving innovation and taking responsibility for our communities. Where health focuses on our goals to develop better therapies and healthcare solutions and address unmet needs in NCDs. We'll be working on using our expertise towards expanding NCD healthcare access for 50 million people in vulnerable communities. We understand that we can, can't do this alone. That is why we value collaborations and long-term partnerships like the DEFEAT NCD partnership to team up to achieve these goals. Given the importance of NCDs, my talk will focus on the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on the prevention and care of NCDs, drawing on a review of the literature and publicly available sources. The talk will cover three topics. First, the status of NCDs prior to the pandemic. Second, the impact of COVID-19 on prevention, early detection and treatment of NCDs, and last, possible approaches to overcome the impact of the pandemic on NCDs through public-private partnerships. So in this first section, I'd like to remind you of the burden of NCDs. NCDs are responsible for seven out of every 10 deaths worldwide. To address this huge burden, and Juliet mentioned this already, the United Nations member states signed up to an ambitious sustainable development goal in 2015 called SDG 3.4, which aims to do two things. First, to reduce premature mortality from NCDs by one third by 2030. And second, to promote mental health and well being. Prior to the pandemic, deaths from the four major NCDs, cancers, 
cardiovascular diseases, chronic respiratory diseases, and diabetes were declining. However, despite this progress, research published in The Lancet in 2020 suggests that less than 10% of countries are on track to achieve SDG 3.4 based on trends in mortality between 2010 and 2016. Their analysis shows that low, middle, and high-income countries are all finding it challenging to meet their goals, and particular challenges are faced by low- and middle-income countries. Even in high-income countries, only six countries, according to the analysis published in The Lancet, were on course to meet SDG 3.4 by 2030 for both men and women. So the question really is, why are so many countries not on target despite their significant efforts? There are no easy answers and country-specific solutions, including fully costed national action plans are needed. However, we do know that reducing the burden of NCDs requires a combination of prevention, early detection, and treatment. For example, prevention strategies such as tobacco and alcohol control are key to reduce deaths from the four major NCDs. For early detection, effective screening is essential particularly to close the survival gap between high and low to middle income countries. And for NCD treatment, consistent and long-term care and access to such care is vital. For instance, real world studies have shown that less than 10% of people with type two diabetes and atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease receive the full set of guideline recommended medications. In some countries, patients have no access to care at all, for example, for stroke and cancer. So what is the impact that COVID-19 has on NCDs? Unfortunately, COVID-19 has a huge detrimental impact just in these very same areas, namely NCD prevention, early detection and treatment. While the impact is unprecedented in high income countries, even worse effects are being felt in lower income countries with already severely under-resourced healthcare systems. This effectively doubles the challenges that they face in reaching their goals. So let's look more closely at the impact on prevention of NCDs. COVID-19 measures such as self-isolation and quarantine have increased exposure to many NCD risk factors, as well as having huge consequences in terms of mental health and well-being. Alcohol and tobacco use have risen, and physical inactivity as well as unhealthy eating habits have increased, leading to significant weight gain in many people. On a positive note, environmental pollution declined during the pandemic, which may have mitigated some of the adverse outcomes. However, the overall, and unfortunately the overall effect on risk factors has been overwhelmingly negative. Now let's consider early detection of NCDs, which has been particularly problematic during the pandemic. Over 50% of countries have postponed public screening programs, which had a profound impact on the diagnosis of NCDs. This is creating a huge challenge for healthcare systems as people present later with symptoms of more advanced disease, which is associated with worse mortality. And as you will hear from my fellow panelist, Paveen Pradeshi from the government of India, NCDs can also have a knock-on effect on COVID-19 mortality. COVID-19 has also had a major impact on the treatment of NCDs. Travel restrictions and limited access to primary healthcare units, pharmacies and community services have disrupted routine care and supply of medicines for NCD patients. Admissions to emergency departments have fallen during the pandemic by up to 45%. The extent of the problem is illustrated by a survey carried out by the World Health Organization during the pandemic, in which more than 120 countries reported that NCD services were disrupted. But you will be hearing more on this topic from my fellow panelists from the World Health Organization shortly. So in this final section, I'd like to talk about the role of public-private partnerships in addressing the challenges of prevention, early detection and treatment, illustrated by examples from Beringer Ingelheim, including more health sustainable development activities. Disease awareness can stimulate behavior change to address all three areas mentioned. Beringer Ingelheim, for example, has recently collaborated with over 10 patient organizations on a new campaign called This is Living, which motivates patients with NCDs to stay healthy and active and to keep up to date with their checkups and prescriptions. In terms of NCD prevention, one of the key recommendations from this year's European Patient Rights Day 
which was supported by several pharmaceutical companies, including Beringer Ingelheim, is to look for early markers of NCD risk in order to provide timely interventions. And public-private partnerships can help to drive prevention efforts. For example, by health insurance companies incorporating financial incentives to promote screening for NCD risk factors and engagement in physical activity programs. Regarding early detection of NCDs, we need to do more to support screening programs. Beringer Ingelheim's Kusa Afia program in Kenya, for example, has screened around 80,000 people for hypertension and diabetes and trained over 500 healthcare professionals. We can also harness the infrastructure that has evolved during the pandemic by delivering NCD screening programs and health advice alongside COVID-19 vaccination programs. This could really help us engage with hard to reach populations, particularly in low and middle income countries. In terms of treatment and continuity of care, we need three things. First, consistent access to care. Second, better guideline implementation. And third, digital solutions to healthcare challenges such as remote consultations, electronic prescribing, and home health monitoring. So at Bering Engelheim, for example, we have an initiative called ANGES Initiative, which has included so far almost 6,000 hospitals across the world, 75% of them in low and middle income countries, and provides them with training, education, consultancy, and quality monitoring to become stroke ready so that they can consistently provide rapid access to care to improve outcomes and save lives. And this week at our Stroke Summit in India, we're bringing together both general and specialist physicians, as well as international experts to raise awareness of stroke and its management. Our Guardians for Health initiative is aiming to reduce cardiovascular and kidney complications in people living with type two diabetes through more consistent guideline implementation. We also supported a pilot scheme providing home health monitoring and follow-up care for NCD patients living in hard to reach areas of Alberta, Canada. This multi-sector effort involving Beringer Ingelheim, as well as a technology provider, the government of Alberta and 19 primary care networks showed reduced healthcare utilization and improved patient quality of life over a six month period. In uh, terms one, of minute, of Henrik, one minute. Yes. In terms of equitable access to medicines, public-private partnership initiatives, such as the Defeat NCD Marketplace, can help to ensure that products reach the countries that most need them. So really, in conclusion, we must take forward important lessons from the pandemic and incorporate them into the way that we tackle NCDs. We need a collaborative approach involving close cooperation between public and private stakeholders. And finally, we need to take ownership of our own responsibilities and hold each other accountable. By doing this, we'll improve prevention, early detection and treatment, and hopefully achieve our goal of reducing mortality from NCDs. Thank you so much for your attention. And thank you so much as well, Henrik, for that excellent presentation there, explaining the value of the public-private partnerships. And what I want to do now is to move things along, well, broaden things out, I should say, by focusing on the science. And this is where I want to bring in Praveen Padeshi. He's coming into this conversation. Just to tell you a little bit about him, he's a member of the administration of the Capacity Building Commission for the Government of India. And before that, he was the programme coordinator for Global Scale-Up for the Defeat NCD partnership so a very familiar face I think to most of us. Now he's going to give us a presentation in which we're going to examine the intersection of NCDs and COVID-19 using as a reference a study by the Defeat NCD Partnership and the Economist Intelligence Unit and just to give you a heads up as well we will be speaking to somebody from the Economist Intelligence Unit who will be referencing that study but for now I'm going to hand things over to Praveen and you have 15 minutes so that is 15 minutes for your presentation. Thank you. This should be good. On the skip. Thank you, Juliet. So, uh, coming straight away uh, to the issue of intersection between non communicable diseases and the raging COVID pandemic, what we found at the Defeat NCD partnership that there is a very surprising correlation between the underlying non-communicable disease burden of that country and the currently observed COVID case fatality rates. For example, Singapore has one of the world's best 
uh, non communicable disease mortality rate which is less than 235 per 100000 uh, population and the mortality rate due to covid case fatality is less than 1% and this keeps increasing as the underlying covid uh, underlying non communicable disease burden increases so you can see that the yeah so the uh, the trend rate which is the yellow line shows the increasing covid case fatality rates as the blue bars which this, uh, tell us about the no, uh, non communicable disease mortality rates the point to note here is the world in total has uh, observed that when you are affected with uh, covid if you already have an underlying mortality or uh, underlying uh, condition of non communicable disease your mortality rates are high i'm not talking about that i'm talking about something totally different i'm talking about if you have if the society as a whole has an underlying non communicable disease morbidity which is very high then that country has a very high rate of covid case fatality rate currently observed now we ran a regression analysis and what we found in this regression which was over 150 countries that every 10 percent decline in the non communicable mortality ratio and this is pre preceding the current COVID case fatality rate, there is a 20% decline in the uh, COVID fatality rates. So going back to what uh, Dr. Tedros said yesterday that the world knows or can finish this uh, pandemic, yes, it can finish the pandemic by tackling the underlying non-communicable disease mortalities, which is as per the, So uh, going further into this regression analysis, what we found that if the, currently, the average global rate is 5 per 1,000 mortalities due to non-communicable diseases. At this rate, we get something like 24 per 1,000 uh, COVID case fatality rates. And if, if there's a country of 60 million like a UK, it would have roughly about 144,000 deaths because of uh, COVID. But if we were to ach achieve these, uh, and a country which is approximating this situation is like Brazil. Uh, if we were to achieve the SDG of reducing mortalities due to non-communicable disease by one third, in which case from five uh, per 1,000, we have 3.75 per 1,000 mortalities due to uh, non-communicable diseases, then you just see the, the impact on COVID. We have 36,000 deaths averted. So it, this is an indirect way of achieving uh, the uh, 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 terminating the uh, pandemic by attacking the underlying non-communicable disease burden. And if we were to have the mortalities due to COVID, uh, due to non-communicable diseases, which is 2.5, and this is achieved in Singapore, we would reach something like 14 per thousand cases of COVID case uh, fatality rates. And this is already achieved, as I said, in, uh, in Singapore, and we would be roughly averting more than 60,000 deaths due to COVID. So the sum and substance of this regression analysis is that maybe the world as a whole is too much focused only on tackling the COVID uh, pandemic and not focused on the underlying determinants of why COVID is so uh, uh, lethal in terms of mortalities. This has another implication, and this implication is very important because the COVID pandemic itself has provided us a great opportunity to make the world more healthy and resilient to future pandemics. Uh, the, uh, at, at Davos, the World Economic Forum predicted or, or estimated that roughly $371 billion spent from now till 2030 would enable the world to achieve universal health access for all. But surprisingly, if you see from the last uh, red bar, in the last one and a half years, the world has spent 4.5 times the, the total amount required for universal health access only on tackling uh, COVID. So this 4.5 times more uh, amount which has been spent has been spent on the response to COVID and not on underlying uh, conditions which uh, make COVID so lethal. There are many opportunities uh, by which the same resources that we have today for, uh, COVID, uh, for COVID can be used uh, synergistically 
for um, using better prevention, better detection, and also better healthcare facilities for uh, uh, non uh, non communicable diseases. Most important is the touch point of the vaccination drive. Uh, at the vaccination drive, uh, the health primary health infrastructure is coming in contact with all the potential patients who also have COVID. And uh, this could be a means to detect undetected cases. In the third world, most of the uh, underlying non-communicable disease conditions are not detected. So th this could be done. And we tried to do this in Mumbai when I was municipal commissioner Mumbai, and we could see that the COVID case fatality rate would be brought down if we could single out the non-communicable uh, disease affected patients and bring them to a, uh, a better, ca better care and better prevention uh, measures. So uh, with this, uh, I, uh, I just want to just say that, yes, the world has the means to stop the COVID uh, pandemic, but this, this is an indirect route. The indirect route lies through tackling the underlying non-communicable disease burden. Thank you. Thank you as much for that, for Pra Praveen Pardeshi, for that presentation, which really was excellent and very comprehensive in terms of using the numbers. And look, you guys are the health experts. I'm certainly not. But the impression that I get just from listening to that and looking at the accompanying graphics is that if the billions invested in the fight against COVID had perhaps been pumped into preventative measures, mm -hmm. the outcome to the situation might have been different. In other words, what we have here is a contradiction at the heart of health spending in this particular area, all of which begs the question, what can you do to reverse that? Because clearly we've got evidence of a spending disparity. And that's a question which I'd also like Dr. Ren, Ming, Dr. Ren Mingui to, to answer, just to explain who the doctor is. He's the Assistant Director General for Universal Health Coverage communicable and non-communicable diseases at the World Health Organization, Organization. And I would like you, doctor, to address that question within the context of how COVID-19 is impacting health systems and how the WHO, your organization, is helping countries to achieve better health outcomes. It's, it's a big question to ask. You've got 15 minutes in which to do it. So I'm gonna hand things over to you. <laughs> <clears throat> thank you, uh, Juliet. Um, thank you, the co-sponsor uh, of the event and uh, at the World Health Summit uh, for the invitation to speak about the pathway uh, for the country around the world to address NCD during the COVID-19 pandemic. Of course, Juliet, um, your questions has to be covered <laughs> probably uh, with me and all the other panelists uh, uh, together. Um, ladies and gentlemen, first of all, I want to express my deepest condolences for the millions of people with NCD who lost their lives to the COVID-19 pandemic. Yet the 1.7 billion people living with or at the risk of NCD around the world are largely excluded from the rooms where decisions are made to recover better from the pandemic. The United Nations General Assembly Resolution 75-130 were the strong signals of political commitment to bolster resilience to the future shocks. The solutions noted with concern that people living with NCD are more susceptible to the risk of developing severe COVID-19 symptoms are among the most affected by the pandemic. The solution also recognized that the necessary efforts for the prevention and the control of NCD are hampered by a lack of universal access to essential health services medicines, diagnosis, and the technical health technologies for NCDs. A number of countries who has uh, collected data on comorbidities for COVID-19 and NCD provide telling evidence that COVID-19 is killing people with NCD. Despite courage efforts in Iran, in the risk of dying among the uh, hospitalized COVID-19 patients with diabetes, is four times higher than those without diabetes. While in Mexico, this number is seven times higher. In India, 70% of fewer accurate cardiac emergencies reached health facilities in real areas. But today, addressing the deadly interplay between COVID-19 and NCDs are in, uh, uh, on concept. Tomorrow, it must be the norm. We can no longer exclude one quarter of a community from the meaningful participation 
in political disease systems that are pushing for breakthroughs leading to a better future for all. Two years into the COVID-19 crisis, severe disruptions of NCD services affecting millions of people with NCDs and causing lasting damage, which those living in low and middle income country bearing the brunt. 71% of countries has disrupted services for diabetes. 59% of countries has disrupted services for cancer screening and 53% has disrupted cancer's treatment. While we all understand the cancer is number two killer in the world. 58% has disrupted hypertension management and 48% has disrupted cardiovascular emergency while cardiovascular diseases are the number one killer in the world. As we are drawing lessons from COVID-19 response, we must ensure that this world never again, and never, never again faces crisis, this magnitude unprepared. The World Health Assembly has asked WHO secretaries for support through the development of implementation roadmap for the Global Action Plan for the Prevention and Control of NCD 2013 to 2030. This roadmap will provide a basis for the countries to decide on a pathway to accelerate the progress towards achievement of SDG target 3.4 in the context 10 years, in the next 10 years. But the roadmap itself is not a solution and a more political commitment on NCD are not a solution either. Investing in inclusive recovery is a solution. Advanced economies are investing nearly 28% of their gross domestic products, that's GDP, into social economic recovery. For lower and middle income countries, that number is between two and 65%. As a tiny proportion of a much smaller amount as debit burdens prevent many governments from investing in recovery. Many of these same low and middle income countries are facing the worst Reverage of a revenge of NCD challenges of epidemic propor uh, proportion, which they did nothing to create. Health systems are slow to respond to NCD. Every two seconds, a person dies prematurely from NCD. Global solidarity for NCD are fo uh, so far has been inadequate. So today's meeting is an absolutely good opportunity to discuss how to change course and build recovery that benefits all. Increasing investment in primary healthcare workforce is a solution. Primary healthcare workforce brings people living with or at risk of NCD into first contact with the health system. This is the most inclusive, effective, and efficient approach to reduce premature deaths from NCD. Many vulnerable lower and middle income countries urgently need a helping hand. WHO has started to support Ethiopia, Ghana, India, Nepal, and many other countries to improve the coverage of services for people with NCD services in primary health settings. The countries tracking NCD epidemics and collecting data, better data must also a part of the solution. The latest data shows that the world has banned the trajectory of NCD epidemic. Globally, the risk of dying from a major NCD between the age of 30 and 70s continues to decline from 22% in 2000 to 17% in the year 2019. But the progress is hardly an event across countries. Only 35 countries has implemented 10 or more of the commitment made on the prevention of control of NCD and the United Nations General Assembly. Only 14, which is one four countries, are on track to achieve the global SDG target 3.4 on NCD for the 2030. No countries are on the track to achieve all the nine voluntary global targets for the 2025 set by the World Health Assembly in the year 2013. The WHO Global Monitoring Report for the Universal Health Coverage 
in 2019 shows rapid improvement in coverage of communicable diseases, particularly since 2005, but relatively lower changes on NCD services and capacity since 2000, particularly in low income countries. The immense scales of NCD burden and changes demographics will generate demands for the additional 14 million global health workers globally by the 2030, on the top of current shortfalls of 18 million health workers in low and middle income countries. So we must heavily invest in protecting and safeguarding the NCD services and the healthcare workforce. The WHO's Global Diabetes Compound, established in April 2021, is a concrete action for investing in the diabetes health and care workforce and addressing barriers in accident insulin. This is particularly relevant and important today as now diabetes has become the ninth leading cause of death. And the latest data from WHO is showing that people living with diabetes at a higher risk of developing severe symptoms from COVID-19 and also dying from this disease. The Consolidated WHO Global Cancer Program provides another opportunity for strengthening the collaboration between the partners and WHO strategies on cervical cancer, which is cervical cancer elimination targets being set by member states and the global childhood cancer, as well as breast cancer. All these required sustained investment global solidarity and the collaboration to strengthen local, national, and regional capacity. WHO is committed to equity in response to COVID-19 pandemic and all areas of health, including NCD. So we welcome the exchange on NCD of independent panel for pandemic preparedness and response, led by um, Helen Clark and NCD Alliance which called for the strengthening NCD efforts as a part of a pandemic recovery. The interplay between the pandemic and NCD should not be neglected in the spectrums of pandemic preparedness and response. WHO will hold special session of the World Health Assembly in the November this year to consider developing a new international instrument on pandemic preparedness and response. No single countries can address pandemics and the global health emergency, NCDs, and other public health challenges alone. This requires commitment from all partners, including member states and the health partners at the World Health Summit, to invest in the systems, measures needed to promote health across whole the life course, protect so health, have five minutes. all time risk, and deliver care and, and services affordably effectively and safely, exactly what they need, and no matter the, the person's gender, nationality, or what is right. It also requires a strong WHO. The COVID-19 has shown that WHO must be strengthened and supported to play its role at the world's leading house, public health agency. So with that, I thank you very much for the opportunity. Probably let us seize this moment as a crisis to transform the NCD agenda and realize our shared vision of a resilience, inclusive, and a sustainable world for all. Thank you again. Dr. Ren, <coughs> excuse me, Dr. Ren Mingui, thank you as well, because there was so much uh, to address within that question that I put to you, and you handled it really well. And just to really recap, what we've done so far is that we've explored the public-private partnership. And also within that answer, you really outlined the spending disparity, how it happens when we're trying to tackle NCDs and the sheer difficulty in trying to address it, but the efforts that are also being made, because clearly it is something from which all of us stand to benefit as a global community. It's important that we work together. There will be pandemics in the future, but there is a way of blunting their lethality. But look, the other thing which has emerged is that countries are not sitting down idly and doing nothing. They are taking their own initiatives, they're working with bodies like the World Health Organization, and they're trying to find a way through this. Now, I'm referring to efforts that are being made on the ground. And at this point, I want to introduce the Honorable Dr. Amadou Lamin Samate. Now, just to tell you a little bit about him, he is the Minister of Health for the government of the Gambia. And over the next 15 minutes, he's going to tell us about the newly developed national multi-sectoral strategy and costed action plan for the prevention and control 
of NCDs for the Gambia. A lot of work has been going on and he's going to share it now with us. So, so, uh, so the floor is now yours. Again, you have 15 minutes. I'm so sorry to have to restrict you in this way, but as you can appreciate, there is a lot of ground to cover in the time we have together, but the floor is yours. You have 15 minutes. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Juliet, and thank you for giving me this opportunity to share with uh, the rest of the world our experience. Uh, and I thank the Defeat NCD Partnership for inviting us to, to this meeting. Uh, typically, uh, of course, we all know the problems uh, many countries, especially the developing countries, have been facing with regards to uh, the management of NCDs. Uh, we typically, uh, historically, had challenges with uh, uh, communicable diseases. You know. Uh, the various infectious diseases being spread across the continent uh, and the countries having to tackle those uh, diseases. Now, the emergence of uh, NCDs, the uh, change in lifestyles, uh, the sedentary lifestyles, uh, the uh, quality of the food that is being eaten, and uh, have all contributed uh, to the emergence of a number of NCDs, uh, which was typically not the case. So we now have a double burden of uh, both communicable and non-communicable diseases, uh, which makes it uh, even more difficult for the management of NCDs. Now, diabetes, hypertension, uh, other cardiovascular diseases, uh, road traffic accidents, trauma, uh, we see in epidemic proportions of trauma in many uh, developing countries. Now, the cancers. Uh, we've seen a lot of cancers, and uh, the unfortunate thing is that the cancers are detected late because the screening tools uh, in many developing countries are not available. Uh, so the screening itself and the knowledge level of the population uh, with regards to uh, what cancer is, uh, uh, how uh, early should it be detected, and what is the benefit of early detection, these are all challenges uh, that non-communicable uh, no, non-communicable diseases uh, face in uh, many of the developing countries, especially uh, in our sub-region. Gambia certainly not excluded. Now, it is very interesting, uh, the link uh, that has been mentioned between uh, the non-communicable diseases and then COVID-19. Uh, it's unprecedented. Uh, COVID-19 came and uh, is this strong association with non-communicable diseases. So that tells you what uh, challenges uh, the extra burden we are having as low uh, middle income countries. We have a situation whereby non-communicable disease uh, management is already a challenge. Now coming to have uh, COVID-19 added onto that and having a vicious cycle, if I may describe it that way, uh, COVID-19, uh, Patients uh, are worse off if they have an underlying non-communicable disease. However, COVID-19 also makes the management of non-communicable diseases more difficult, uh, even from the access to healthcare. During the, uh, at the beginning of the pandemic, uh, many individuals certainly stayed home, avoided hospitals because they were afraid, first of all, to be diagnosed of having COVID-19 at the hospitals. Now, because of the stigma that was associated with COVID-19 at the beginning. Nobody wanted to be diagnosed as having COVID-19. So people stayed away from hospitals because those were the uh, sites where people were developed, uh, diagnosed as having COVID-19. Now, people who were diagnosed in those days uh, were stigmatized and their families were stigmatized. We've had uh, communities uh, being avoided because one or two people were diagnosed as having COVID-19. That means people with non-communicable diseases stayed home. They never went to the hospitals to get their su supplies. They never went back to check their BPs. They never went back to check uh, uh, their blood sugars. And that meant that uh, they only came when uh, you know they, they, they go beyond uh, uh, what it should be, uh, severe complications. So stroke levels uh, would have gone up. Uh, people with uh, very high blood sugar levels uh, would have gone up. Now, when they also got to the hospitals, uh, the challenges were also there because uh, you know people focus also was on management of COVID-19. Certain health facilities uh, had their staff also infected uh, with COVID-19, so the healthcare uh, providers themselves were affected, and we had uh, many situations whereby health facilities were not be able to give the services uh, that uh, was required of them. 
nonetheless, something needed to be done. So as a country, uh, we strategized. Uh, we uh, made sure that uh, people with uh, uh, NCDs uh, receive some form of home care. So at home, they could have been seen to monitor their blood sugars, to monitor their BPs. Now, when uh, they also were given uh, prescriptions, uh, medications were provided for longer periods, uh, so that the frequency with which uh, they would have gone to the health facilities was reduced. There was also a hotline, uh, you know, universally in the country, where people could call to get some medical assistance uh, to address their concerns. Uh, this all helped. Uh, in trying to uh, make sure that uh, NCD services continued uh, to some, so, some extent uh, in the country. Now, together with our partners, uh, both local and globally, uh, and uh, taking the lead in that uh, was the, uh, the Defeat NCD partnership. Uh, fortunately, this partnership continued during the pandemic. Uh, we had collaboration, we had meetings, and it was uh, at uh, the helm of the pandemic. In fact, uh, we actually got uh, the NCD country coordinator sent to the Gambia uh, to help us uh, improve on the strategies, to look at the actual management of NCDs on the country, uh, to de develop a national multi-sectoral uh, strategy, and uh, have a costed action plan. Uh, for non-communicable diseases, because these are all important. Uh, the fact that uh, NCD management uh, had attention uh, at uh, the peak of the pandemic uh, was a very in in important strategy, uh, because many countries focused purely on COVID management, and uh, NCD uh, management was relegated to the background. So I think as a country, this has been very important that irrespective of the pandemic, we made sure that uh, NCDs also uh, received some attention. Now, it's very interesting that uh, COVID-19 actually uh, received global solidarity. Uh, why that happened, uh, probably we can research into that. Uh, but uh, I do not know whether because it was an infectious disease that was uh, ravaging the world, country by country, all countries were affected. But I certainly believe that uh, that solidarity can certainly be extended uh, to deal with NCDs. Uh, when we come together, uh, you mentioned the resources spent uh, to take care of uh, COVID-19 uh, throughout the globe. Probably we should spend a similar amount or even more to deal with NCDs. And the fact that uh, it was doable for COVID-19 probably means it is doable for the management of NCDs globally. Now, I think, and there's a good reason to do so. The fact that uh, COVID-19 and NCD, I believe, have this vicious cycle. If we want to eradicate COVID-19, to remove the reservoir for COVID-19, I think it is very important also we deal with the NCDs because otherwise uh, people with NCDs probably will serve as the reservoirs for COVID-19 and making uh, the eradication of COVID-19 more and more difficult. As a country, to be able to achieve our SDGs, uh, 3.4, and uh, other aspects of the SDGs, because all these are uh, inter interlinked. And uh, with our partners, uh, we have put forward strategies. Uh, those are in our national COVID, uh, uh, NCD strategy, uh, which we were helped to develop as a country by the uh, Defeat NCD partnership, uh, with strong leadership uh, from the country, the Ministry of Health, and collaboration with other agencies, the WHO, other UN agencies, and other multi-sectoral players. Uh, so we try to make sure that uh, we prioritize NCDs. Uh, NCD prioritization as a country has been at the forefront uh, of our national strategy. Uh, so we have now uh, formed a cancer unit for the first time in the history of our country, the Gambia. Uh, we have a cancer control program. And from January 2022, uh, we're also going to have uh, uh, a trauma control program that is going to deal with uh, accidents and uh, trauma victims because we've seen that uh, another challenge we're having as uh, developing countries uh, with increased uh, road networks, with increased uh, motor transport, uh, a lot of our productive uh, youth uh, are dying because of uh, road traffic accidents and the subsequent management that uh, uh, they get. 
Another point uh, is to strengthen the NCD capacity, leadership and governance. At the uh, very high level, we've had uh, our president and, uh, and other stakeholders, uh, including other top civil servants who engage uh, in preventive strategies, uh, making sure that uh, they participate in exercise regime, uh, re and then also having walks, you know, along the al along the roads to 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 encourage people uh, to do away with uh, sedentary lifestyles. We have had NCD talks uh, during the presidential tour. Uh, when I had the opportunity to talk about uh, a strategy of community ambulance uh, introduction in the Gambia. The Gambia has introduced community ambulances uh, whereby very sick people in the communities will be picked from their doorsteps and sent to the nearest health facilities. This certainly will benefit the NCD response, response to NCD care, because typically what happens uh, before the introduction of these community ambulances is people get sick and uh, they stay at home or go on a donkey or a horse cart to be taken to a health facility and take uh, probably take hours to get to a health facility. As a country, we have just introduced community ambulances, which will pick people from their homes to health facilities. And this certainly is a big plus for the care of NCDs. Now, during the presidential tour, as uh, we looked at development issues, uh, as health minister, I took the opportunity to talk to people about checking their BP, checking their blood sugars, and making sure that they continue treatment. Uh, this is where we have thousands of people gathered to listen to the president, and we use that as an opportunity to sensitize the people with regards to NCDs and other uh, diseases. Uh, risk reduction, as I mentioned also, is a, is a very uh, important aspect. Uh, we have the RCC teams that are always talking on the radio and TV and doing community engagements to make sure that uh, people know about the risk uh, for development of uh, NCDs. Health system strengthening is very important because increased awareness and then awareness is there. What do we do for these people? They go to a health facility, they've been told that they are diabetic, but if they do not have the possibilities of even monitoring that diabetes, if insulin is not available, if glucometers are not available, then it becomes a problem. So the health systems need to be strong to make sure that these people are being taken care of. So when people get to the health facilities, the control for diabetes, control for hypertension, early detection of cancers uh, is very important. Uh, and when it is detected, what happens? Because we cannot just tell people they've got, they, they have a cancer and then uh, we leave them to uh, suffer their fate. Uh, we need to do something for them. So health system capacity building should be at the forefront of NCD management. We think uh, there should be enough partnership to make sure that the systems are strong enough. Uh, all countries have capacity to deal with the cancers. All, all countries have possibility to have uh, chemotherapeutic agents uh, to provide provide care for the cancer patients, radiotherapy. Uh, oncology services are not available in most of our low uh, and middle income countries. Research is very important because a whole lot of uh, aspects uh, of uh, NCDs we talk about in many of our countries is anecdotal. Uh, it is not based by uh, real time data, if it were. So strengthening uh, making sure that uh, whatever we do is evidence based. So evidence based interventions are very critical to a successful management of uh, NCDs. Uh, so we in our uh, six point uh, uh, strategy, we are emphasizing on uh, building capacity uh, for the uh, evidence-based research so that uh, whatever resources are put in there uh, uh, are guided by the evidence and then they can uh, yield the impact. Uh, that is desired. Monitoring and evaluation uh, is, is also at the forefront uh, of our strategy. Because without that, uh, you know, we may never know whether whatever we do is impactful. Now, together with our partners, NCD Partnership and other partners, uh, the Defeat NCD Partnership, we are putting forward uh, these strategies. Certainly, we need to uh, be supported in capacity building uh, to make sure that uh, this uh, bear fruits. We also uh, need to have make sure that uh, we typically uh, work together. Uh, for us to be able to defeat COVID-19, we certainly need to make sure that NCDs get the attention that they deserve. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I was about to say that uh, we have to call this your section to an end. But look, you have given us so much information. You really have hit the ground running in the Gambia, the way that you've tackled this. And what struck me as, as extremely impressive as well was that 
not only are you trying to deal with a health issue you're dealing with COVID, but you're also trying to tackle the stigma as well. And it's getting people involved and taking advantage of situations. You mentioned there the political campaigns. Who are you using that to actually uh, test the blood pressure, that sort of thing. So thank you so much, Minister, for giving us that really thorough overview of what is happening in the Gambia. And what I want to do now is to go back to another concept that we've been exploring here, really the, the crux of what our discussion is all about today, and that is partnership. Now, earlier we were looking at the public-private partnership, but I want to focus on another dimension to that concept. And this is where Makiko Toyoda comes in. Now, she is the head of the Global Trade Finance Programme, International Finance Co Corporation at the World Bank Group. So it's very, very good to see you. Thank you for being here. And look, we know that the IFC is at the forefront of financing the private sector for development in low to middle income countries. But how can it support partnerships like the Defeat NCD partnership to finance the achievement of universal access to health? And within this context, can you also give us details about a new pilot scheme to finance the marketplace so that you can support access to drugs and diagnostics working with the Defeat NCD partnership. It's a two-in-one question, so if you can give us um, a general overview within the time available, we would be extremely grateful. Thank you, Juliet, uh, for your introduction, and thank you for inviting us to this important meeting. Um, I'm not so sure how many of you have interacted with IFC in the past, but IFC is a private sector financing arm of the World Bank, and our mandate is to support developing countries. Um, we started our trade finance operations back in 2004 uh, because we realized that many developing countries were not able to import essential goods. Uh, what was happening at that time is that sometimes the exporters' banks cannot take the risk of importers' countries and hesitate to allow the exporters to ship the goods to these countries. So IFC started um, doing trade finance operations. And what we do is that the IFC provides up to 100% guarantee for such import transactions so that the exporters can ship the goods to developing countries. So since then, IFC has supported about 0.2 trillion US dollars of trade. And the program I am in charge, which is called the Global Trade Finance Program, and this is the largest program at IFC, has supported over 74 billion US dollars of trade in 99 countries so far and 60% of the guarantees went to low-income and fragile countries. And then just to name a few countries, those include Afghanistan, Iraq, Syria, Yemen, Mauritania, Mali, Liberia, Chad, and so on. Uh, at this moment, Africa is the largest region in our portfolio, and food and medical goods are IFC's priorities. Um, but then to be frank with you, the medical sector's usage under our program is really low at this moment, and we intend to market our guarantee products in low-income countries. Um, for example, those medical sectors, we supported the goods, something like uh, medical supplies, medical equipment, me diagnostic supplies, testing equipment, medicines, acute care supplies, surgical supplies, and so on. Uh, in the medical sector, we have supported 68 countries so far, and then those countries include, for example, Iraq, uh, West Bank and Gaza, Burkina Faso, Cameroon, DRC, Tajikistan, and so on. And in many cases, the exporters banks cannot take the risk of these countries. And without the multilateral development bank like IFC's guarantees, the exporters will not ship the goods to the destinations. So public and private partnership is important here. The IFC's mandate is to support the private sector, but for food and medical goods, oftentimes the importers are the government or the public sector. Because we would like to support the import of these medical goods, we have decided to accept the governments or the public sector as the importers for those medical goods. And then not so many importers banks know that IFC can support the private uh, public sector's import financing needs. Uh, we strongly support the Defeat NCD partnership. Uh, we have just launched the initiative with our sister organization in the World Bank Group, which is called MIGA to include more state-owned banks in a trade finance program. At present, we have 240 banks as a registered uh, banks uh, in our program, uh, but we have only a handful of state-owned banks. And we intend to add more of these state-owned banks working together with MIGA. The why is because these state-owned banks have more relationship with the government or the public sector. When these medical goods are procured or imported by the government or the public sector, 
uh, we hope to support the import financing needs through state-owned banks. Um, this is objective of this new partnership that we are launching at this moment. And then we hope we will be able to expand our medical sector support through the Defeat NCD partnership. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Makiko Toyoda, because what you described there illustrates the innovative finance tools that are being used to help countries battle NCD. So thank you so much for that. But it's also worth noting as well that the model she described is unique because it's the first of its kind in the pharmaceutical sector. So that's an exclusive news story there, if anyone wants to run with it, which I think you should. But that's up to you. Let me bring in now Dr. Deborah Huri. Now, she's the Principal Deputy Director at the US Centers for Disease Control. Now, unfortunately, she isn't able to be with us, but she did send a response to the question, which, uh, which, which, which was this, in fact, the following question. It was the Centers for Disease Control has been leading efforts in the USA to combat the COVID-19 pandemic. We asked her to tell us how the CDC and international partnerships like Defeat NCD are collaborating to tackle the twin challenges of COVID-19 and the underlying non-communicable disease burden. So let's hear her response. Hello, I'm Dr. Deborah Howry, Acting Principal Deputy Director of the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the CDC. It's an honor to address non-communicable diseases at the World Health Summit. CDC is very much aware that 85% of premature non-communicable diseases or NCD deaths occur in low and middle income countries. And we know that underlying NCDs are a major contributor to mortality in the current COVID-19 pandemic. Before the pandemic, we were already seeing increases in things like drug overdoses, mental health issues, obesity, and hypertension. During the pandemic, the burden of these and other NCDs has worsened. So it is more important now than ever before to address these NCDs. With our global partners, we are collaborating in many NCD programs. These programs have three essential elements. First, we produce the scientific evidence that shows the importance of NCDs, not only in terms of their impact on health, but on their economic impact. Investment in NCD prevention and control could prevent millions of premature deaths and billions in economic loss. Every dollar invested today in proven NCD initiatives generates at least $7 in increased economic development and reduce healthcare costs by the end of this decade. And there is an equal need to produce evidence showing that science-based interventions can greatly reduce NCD burdens. For example, CDC reported that the Saving Mothers Giving Life Initiative, a program to reduce maternal mortality, reduced pregnancy deaths by 44% in Uganda and by 41% in Zambia. Second, we must strengthen nation's public health infrastructure and workforce capacity. We work to empower countries to address health needs and avoid health crises. CDC's field epidemiology training program has been enormously successful in creating the backbone of many nations' public health workforces. And CDC's hypertension management training, designed for primary healthcare workers and managers, can be tailored to any nation's needs. And finally, we must improve NCD surveillance monitoring and evaluation systems to enable countries to set priorities, target interventions, and monitor successes. One example is the innovative use of mobile telephones to produce timely, affordable, and accurate data to monitor trends. Through the Bloomberg Philanthropies Data for Health initiative, CDC supports countries' use of this technology to build local data sharing capacity. This initiative uses open source technology so countries can freely adapt it to other public health needs. What we are seeing during the COVID-19 pandemic should not be a surprise. What we have known for a long time that NCDs make nations less resilient when outbreaks occur. It has never been more important to address NCDs on a global scale. Changing social, economic, climate, and structural factors mean that more people are moving to cities. 
and the spread of unhealthy lifestyles is fueling an NCD crisis. I look forward to working with you all as we partner to address this crisis. Big thanks there to Dr. Deborah Howry, and she is from the Centers for Disease Control, the Principal Deputy Director at the US Centers for Disease Control. Now, earlier in the session, we heard from Praveen Pradesh, and when he was going through the numbers, he also referenced a study which is carried out by the Defeat NCD Partnership and the Economist Intelligence Unit. Now, Dr. Chrissy Bishop is an associate at the Health Policy and Clinical Evidence Team at the EIU. It's very, very good to see you. And look, when you listen to that presentation that was made by Praveen and you hear what other guests have consequently had to say, the initiatives that they're taking and the problems they've identified, that research appears to suggest that many governments perhaps took the wrong course by putting the emphasis on COVID-19 without addressing or indeed fully appreciating the connection with non-communicable diseases. So what has that done to NCD healthcare systems and the means to access them? And how many years could it take for these services to get back to where they were before the pandemic? Thank you, Julia. Thanks for the question. And firstly, it's been fascinating to be part of this discussion. I'm really grateful to be able to contribute. And what I just want to talk about is the results that Praveen presented earlier. There are certain things that we can do to further strengthen those results to make those uh, the impact of COVID-19 fatality even to a greater magnitude than we saw earlier. We know the analysis can be strengthened by including information on excess deaths. This data is really hard to come by, even in developed nations. Excess deaths are a critical uh, explanatory factor when trying to accurately estimate COVID-19 fatality in a country. And this is because they account for both total COVID-19 deaths due to the disease, but also the indirect impacts of the pandemic response, such as travel restrictions, cancellation of routine health services, et cetera. What we would really like to do is include this into the analysis Praveen presented earlier. We've seen that recently evidence has shown that countries with well-certified deaths actually have higher COVID-19 fatality rates compared to those with less well-certified deaths. And if we added this into the analysis, we would see higher COVID-19 fatality rates. So we really want to encourage um, better analysis and availability of that data so we can accurately estimate the impact that COVID-19 is actually having on health systems and how to better fund NCD services. Lastly, it would have been really or highly desirable to include a measure of health system financing into the analysis we presented earlier. If we did that, we might also be able to understand the extent to which this has also affected COVID-19 fatalities. And again, a better understanding of how to fund NCD services. So a deep dive into health system financing landscapes in low middle income countries is really better needed to understand uh, how we can uh, better finance health systems. Thank you. Okay, Chrissy Bishop, thank you very much for that. And look, I want to bring in another doctor, this time Dr. Bente Mickelson. Now, she is the Director of Non-Communicable Diseases in the Division of UHC Communicable and Non-Communicable Diseases at the World Health Organization. And following on from that, Dr. Mickelson, very good to see you. I mean, how has your department been, been working with partnerships like Defeat NCD to actually help countries maintain their progress in the fight against non-communicable diseases? Because look, it isn't easy if you have a health system which, which has challenges of its own, it may be inherently weak. And at the same time, you've got the pressure coming through from NCDs and of course the worries about vaccination, et cetera. So what are you doing to help maintain that progress and take it further? <clears throat> Thanks a lot, Juliet, and excellent uh, to be here and such a fantastic contribution from all speakers so far. So I just want to respond to your question to, to give a little bit of a, a context as well. So um, people in the chat have asked about funding and for sure there hasn't been an underinvestment of NCD. And I think Prashin has showed us that the investment and also echoed by CDC that we can really achieve a, a lot of return of investment. And, uh, and the COVID were really laying bare that we didn't do well enough. But I want to be on a positive note because if we look at the last decade, 
uh, we used 300 million uh, US dollars. Now we have doubled it in 2021. And there are several donors coming around. I have seen now that we have uh, long-term investment from governments of Norway, Denmark, the European Commission, Russian Federation, Germany, and we also see flourishing partnership from CDC, as mentioned here, Resolve to Save Life, St. Jude's, World Diabetes uh, Foundation, and also we see that the joint programs Be Healthy, Be Mobile, and partners like Defeat NCDs are so important. So coming back to your precise question, of course, what we have done during COVID is to continue the main task of WHO. So we provide technical support. We have also uh, continued to progressively cover more additional people with essential health service. And we have developed guidance during COVID across programs to support that as well. And of course, we are building on the huge commitment that Dr. Ren was speaking to from three high levels uh, meetings. So we have actually been able to maintain, although as we have seen in our latest survey, we have a huge disruption. And many of the reasons why we have this disruption is, of course, deployment of uh, the very scarce staff on NCD towards other uh, areas. But I think what we need to focus on is what Dr. Tedros spoke to yesterday. I mean, it's equity. Equity is the, the heart of whatever WHO do in all areas of health. So when COVID have laid bare the inequities and the huge underinvestment in NCD, I have hopes that actually the COVID and the building back better is triggering transformable and sustainable changes and that we have the possibility now to strengthen and build the partnerships that we have on the way to be able to really focus on the 74% of the debts that comes from NCD. We need to do this to reach the health for all. So um, many, many has uh, already mentioned some of the partnerships that has been uh, effective during the last 10 years, but I think they, they are for inspiration because they come with a reason. Already in 2007, Bloomberg Philanthropies identified tobacco as the largest, most underfunded public health issue. And that happens to then trigger really the support from Bloomberg since then. And I think that is one of the most effective uh, partnerships we have seen so far. The success of the collaboration is really about data, data-driven changes, as we also heard from several uh, people. Uh, and I think the second was also driven by real awareness building. So when Vital Strategy is now working with WHO to prevent the death from cardiovascular diseases, which is the number one cause of that in the world, in the low and middle income countries, and also during COVID, the objectives is really to save 100 million more people. And we have seen that through this partnership, it is possible to work in countries and we were celebrating that 3 million more people were uh, now on treatment if we compared to before. I also want to mention one partnership coming from uh, the cancer area and I know that we will also uh, hopefully hear about cancer uh, from the next speaker. But when we see the, the <clears throat> huge investment now in the partnership from St. Jude's Children's Research Hospital, really to reduce inequity and to try to achieve at least 60% survival from childhood cancer globally, and to reduce the, I would say, quite horrible inequity we see uh, among different countries and within countries. And what we have been able to do through that partnership, also mentioned by Dr. Tedros yesterday, is to work in 50 countries and with 120 global partners. Uh, if you want to look at what that can sort of achieve, you can uh, see that in Ghana, Peru, and Uzbekistan. So my last example uh, is uh, from the government of Norway. This is the first OECD country that has uh, got a, a NCD development strategy approved in their own country. 
and they have now started to invest long term with WHO and other partners. So what we can see today is uh, hope in uh, those countries engaged. And at the moment, we will do integrated support to five countries uh, like Ghana, India, uh, Nepal, Myanmar and Ethiopia, and we will be able to really combine the, the efforts for prevention and control. So I think uh, you can trust that WHO is focusing on inequity. We will try to use now all the innovation that we have seen coming through COVID, and we need to fight inequities. We need to save lives. And to do that, I think all of us in this meeting, and I hope all of the leaders of the world see that we need to prevent and control NCD as we are building back better. And if you want to know more, we will very soon now publish our new survey, and you will see that the mitigation strategies is also spurring new partnerships and new uh, ideas. So um, especially in digital health, but also to access to medicines and new uh, service models, but also a new way of um, shifting tasks um, uh, among the healthcare workers. So um, this was a little bit of a, let's say a teaser, uh, but uh, we can see that um, investing in WHO gives results also in a situation during COVID and NCD. Thank you. Over to you. Thank you very much, Dr. Mickelson. It was a teaser, but a very comprehensive one as well. So we, we appreciate that. But look, I want to uh, close out this part of the session because we will be taking questions from our audience with Mohammed Mursaid Kaha from the Islamic Development Bank. So thank you so much for being with us. And the question which I want to put to you is the following, because look, we know that ISDB and UNITAR, they have entered into a global partnership to assist countries in their fight against NCDs like cancer, for example. But how will the bank support international partnerships to achieve that sustainable development goal 3.4? Okay, thank you very much, Juliet. Uh, um, um, actually, um, uh, it's a great pleasure for me to attend this uh, high-level workshop, high-level uh, event, and uh, um, and it gives me even a greater pleasure to speak uh, about the partnership between Islamic Development Bank and UNITAR and Defeat uh, NCD Partnership. IDB, as you know, has 57 member states and is working uh, with Defeat NCD Partnership to scale up NCD services in terms of availability, affordability, and quality in member countries and beyond. Health is uh, one of the key, uh, actually, uh, objective promotion of health in member countries is one of the key, key objectives of the ISTB group vision with a focus on priority areas such as health system strengthening and diseases prevention and control and alternative health financing. Um, since inception, IDB has approved a total financing of about 4.6 billion dollars for health sector operations. It includes grant resources, loans, and concessional resources for cancer control programs, and, and, and including, uh, as well as other NCDs in other member countries, including uh, uh, Senegal, Uzbekistan, Niger, Nigeria, Guinea, Guinea um, Iran, Suriname, and Djibouti, actually. These are the countries which we have flagship programs for addressing cancer and controlling cancer in these countries. I will provide a little bit of more information um, uh, about our operations, especially in Central Asia. Uh, the partnership uh, uh, defeat NCD partnership has been an important partner for IDB, uh, especially with regards to ISTB's initiatives for controlling non-communicable diseases in its member countries. IDB fully aligns with the vision of defeat NCD partnership that a public, power, private, and people involvement is much needed to achieve universal health coverage by 2030, and that the neediest and most vulnerable communities should be proactively supported and, 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 and covered. Uh, our joint work plan uh, enhances uh, national capacities and ensures uh, that relevant institutes have essential structures and financing to tackle NCDs. 
in our member countries. We also scale up community-led action to screen, detect, and improve care for NCDs patients in other member countries. IDB is also supporting the Defeat NCD Partnership Marketplace to enable quality and competitively priced medicines, medical diagnostics and supplies to how resource to, 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 to low resource member states and low income countries through provision of alternating and concessional resources and also that could, and, and, and also mobilizing additional resources from development partners for co-financing health sector operations. This includes uh, trade financing uh, support uh, in support of NCD-related procurement. Uh, Gombia is an example of this support where we will work with the government and defeat NCD partnership to scale up cancer care. Um, after successful implementation of joint plan, IDB will also be joining the governance mechanism, a partnership to allow ISDB's experience to extend to all 90 plus uh, low resource countries, the initial focus of uh, partnership. Uh, I can I can provide a little bit of information on our flagship program uh, for combating cancer and promoting oncology services, improving oncology services in Central Asia. We have initiated this uh, flagship program uh, actually in Uzbekistan with two phases of our project for improving oncology services. The first phase with total cost of $72 million coming to end this the coming December. It includes a uh, provision of diagnostic and treatment equipment and training of medical healthcare from healthcare providers. And the second phase, which was uh, approved December, in December 2020, uh, it is $122 million project. It covers wide range of equipment, including a screening of uh, 1.8 million um, women for cervical and, and, and breast cancer. It has also wide range of activities for early diagnosis and treatment of gastrointestinal and childhood cancers in the, in the, in the country. We have one minute, one minute. Okay. Uh, uh, the... Uh, Actually, this, there is also another initiative with IDB and IAEA. Uh, uh, they have jointly uh, established a fund for saving uh, women's life. And there are also Sukuks, which is Islamic bonds for cancer initiatives. Uh, I think the, the momentum is there and we are open for further cooperation in the region. There are, uh, in, for example, in Central Asia, requests from member countries to go for oncology service improvement in the country. And we think that there is a great opportunity for enhancing partnership with uh, Defeat NCD uh, partnership and other development partners in addressing uh, non-communicable diseases. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mohamed Melsaykaha. I'm so sorry to have to interrupt you there because uh, sadly time is going against us as there are quite a few questions that we wish to take from our audience. No, no, no we... issue, no issue. <laughs> Thank you. We appreciate the fact though that you've taken the Thank time. You. To Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. But we do have a few minutes left before we hear the closing remarks of of this session. So that's enough time to squeeze in a few questions from our audience and we have been receiving them. So thank you so much for that. To those of you who are here, there are standing microphones positioned around the room. So if you want to put a question to a member of the panel, you can, you can see the microphones go there and say what it is that you have to say. If you're watching this via Zoom, then use the question tab on your screen and we'll try to answer as many of your questions in the time available. Quite a few coming in. Pravin, you're obviously very popular with people because most of the questions are directed directed to you. But we've got one here. NCDs are often described as lifestyle diseases and are linked to urban air pollution, smog, chemical fertilizers and pesticides. Are environmental quality improvements being considered in LMICs for improved health of the people? Thank, uh, thank you for that. We, we in the Defeat NCD partnership had done a study with the uh, IIT Mumbai. And what we found is that uh, urban air pollution is a big driver for both uh, lung cancer 
and also for chronic lung diseases, amongst other things. So one of the solutions that uh, we uh, thought about is better urban planning, which ensures that there is a shift from private transport to public transport. In Mumbai, for example, the major source of pollution is use of private vehicles as a means of transportation. So one of the ways is to shift to public transport, which reduces the CO2 emissions per passenger kilometer. And secondly, is better urban planning, where we can have the urban uh, location of the workplaces and residential areas around the urban transportation uh, hubs. Uh, and this is around public transport. So better recycling of waste also helps in this way. So these are some of the things that we need to consider. And the pilot that we were working with is with UNEP and also with the Indian Institute of Technology, uh, Mumbai, to have uh, urban planning, which mitigates CO2 emissions and thereby reduces the impact on NCDs and other health parameters. Thank you. Thank you very much, Praveen. And a question which I want to put to Bente, Dr. Mickelson, and also the Minister, the Health Minister for the Gambia. COVID-19 has also shown clearly that strong primary health care and community systems are foundational to a COVID-19 response. Such systems are key for NCD management, what can we do to increase financing for primary and community health care? Why are there still such large gaps in PHC systems, even though we know PHC is central to health system resilience? So can I put that question to you first, Dr. Mickelson, and then if I can throw it to the health minister of the Gambia, Dr. Mickelson. Uh, thanks a lot. And uh, a lot of the, uh, the tools and guidance that WHO is developing also through the special program on PHC is speaking, of course, at the core for non-communicable diseases. So we have for many years implemented something we call the PEN package. But I think what is uh, behind the question is um, the concern, which is really a, a huge concern, that if you look at the implementation or the inclusion of NCD into UHC, which again is sort of a prerogative to be able to build strong health systems, we can see that NCD has been very slow in being part of uh, the, the UHC, the universal health coverage. So I think a big learning point from uh, what we have seen during COVID is that we need to build the primary health care systems more strong, and we will continue to give guidance on the integration of NCD into primary health care, but also that we need to have um, governments really uh, acknowledge the need for um, uh, benefit packages for NCD. And of course, uh, the only way to have sustainable uh, UHC is also to uh, have a sustainable health budget and to make the international uh, financing system also step up for NCD. You know probably that less than 2% of all international funding is for NCD, while 74% of all debts comes from NCD. So both of them are necessary. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. And can I have a quick response to that, please, from the minister, the health minister for the Gambia, please. Thank you. Th thank you very much, Juliet. Uh, I think that's a very important question in the sense that uh, in the Gambia, we believe uh, the solution to most of uh, uh, the health issues, especially uh, NCDs, is uh, going back to the primary health care level. Now, we have... Uh, a program what we call uh, a revitalization of the primary health care roadmap because we believe it's a solution to many of our health problems. Uh, an example is uh, uh, during a survey uh, recently conducted, 79% uh, of the people uh, who were found to be hypertensive did never knew that they were hypertensive before. So if we have a primary health care system whereby there's access in the communities, these people would have been picked up and then probably have averted the, the strokes, the heart attacks, the kidney failures, and so on and so forth. So uh, half of the, uh, the, the, the villages in the Gambia, uh, about half are primary health care uh, villages. Now we want to expand that to the entire country whereby all the villages become primary health care villages. That's very fundamental on our uh, on our strategy. Now, the other thing is uh, the provision of universal health coverage, uh, because that's the thing, uh, irrespective of what we do, if health care is not accessible uh, to everybody in the community, then uh, we are not winning. Uh, 
uh, to support the universal healthcare uh, in the communities, the Gambia is launching uh, the National Health Insurance Scheme. So in two days time, I'm presenting the bill to the National Assembly. Uh, if the bill passes, we'll have a National Health Insurance Scheme, which will have a package so that uh, people have access uh, to healthcare wherever they are, whether they are rich or poor, whether they have resources or not, uh, these services will be available to them using the primary healthcare model. Thank you. Thank you very much. Time is is moving very, very quickly. I want to squeeze in one final question, and if you could be brief with your answer. This is to Dr. Wren. What is the projection of private innovation driving public good? Very, very briefly, in about 30 seconds before I close down this session and pass it on to the Defeat NCD CEO, Mukul Bola. Thank you, uh, Juliet. As I said, I think um, we need the actions, we need the solutions, but the action solutions are supposed to be all with all the partners. That's exactly the reason why, why we need the global sanitary as we need it for the time being to respond to COVID-19. Thank you very much. That was brief, but you know what? We got the point. Thank you so much for that. And yes, as I said, time is against us. But before we end the day's proceedings, I want to hand the floor to McCall Bola. Now, he is the CEO of the Defeat NCD Partnership, and he's going to share his closing remarks with us. So, McCall, over to you. Thank you, Juliet. Um, and thank you and much appreciation to the over 455 participants that have joined us online, in person, um, flown into Berlin as well and uh, got up very early in many parts of, of the world and, or stayed up late actually in, in, in some cases North America. Um, I'm quite confident that there's no need for me to repeat that the intersection between NCDs and COVID-19 cannot be denied uh, and has to be addressed rather urgently. Uh, governments, scientists, global health uh, experts and private sector partners have elaborated enough what I would like to, however, remind us and reiterate is that there can be no discussion about universal health coverage without having NCDs at the core of this discussion. There is no need to end this um, pandemic and its social and economic impact without moving towards um, healthy populations uh, relieved from unnecessary burden of NCDs. Moreover, there's no global response plan that will protect future generations from upcoming pandemics uh, with, without strong, affordable and resilient NCD prevention and care. We all know that there will be future pandemics and unfortunately people will die, uh, but we still can take control and drastically reduce the impact and the suffering if we effectively address non-communicable diseases. The tools are there. The World Health Organization is playing a critical role in setting the standards and formulating guidance on the most effective and efficient ways to tackle non-communicable diseases. Private sector is investing more and more in research and development in support of low resource countries and improving access to quality supplies and care. Resources do exist as the Defeat NCD Partnership and Economist Intelligence Unit research has, has clearly shown and so articulated earlier in Praveen's presentation today. And developing countries are taking the lead and setting example to the world with their commitment and advancement in tackling NCDs and an effective health systems wide and multi sectoral approach. The Gambia is develop, uh, developing its first ever national strategy and costed action plan for non communicable disease prevention and care um, during COVID uh, pandemic time. Commendable, really, Minister. Um, and as he mentioned, uh, Gambia has shown that a very practical example that blood sugar and blood pressure can be checked at COVID touch points uh, of vaccination and COVID testing. Um, Rwanda is advancing fast on implementing its own national costed action plan, which was launched uh, last month on the 29th of September. Um, this year alone, Rwanda has screened more than 108,000 women for cervical cancer, kept HPV vaccination coverage at 97% and screened around 6,000 children for rheumatic heart disease. So I echo the call of uh, Minister Amadou Lamine Samate. The way forward is through strong partnerships. The way forward is to join our collect collective knowledge, skills, and resources to build healthy, productive, and resilient communities. I'd like to appreciate um, the strong support from the Islamic Development Bank, particularly uh, the pilot program that we are co-developing 
to support uh, cancer care mortalities in uh, in the Gambia. And we hope that in the coming months, um, this, this will be a very practical example of our first engagement with the Islamic Development Bank. Makiko, thank you very much for supporting the Defeat NCD marketplace and specifically enlarging the scope of the IFC support to include uh, and allow the importation by public health agencies um, of non-communicable disease drugs and diagnostics. These low, this facility will essentially scale up and, 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 and enable low and middle income countries to benefit from increased access of fair priced uh, essential NCD drugs and diagnostics. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And also a big thanks to our panel for making the time to be with us, for sharing their thoughts, their data, their energy and their commitment. And we also thank those of you who have been here physically with us in this room and those of you who were streaming in online. Thank you too for your questions. Apologies, we didn't get through them all, but time was the enemy. But we welcome your attendance. Have a good day, everybody, and please stay safe.